Well, my name is Charlie Foskett, Chair of the Finance Committee. Permit me to confirm that all members are present and I will shortly take the, the roll. This open meeting of the Arlington Finance Committee is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency as a result of the COVID-19 virus. To mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we've been advised and directed to suspend public meetings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in publicly accessible physical locations. Furthermore, all members public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment only in writing by email to T. Bradley at town.arlington.ma.us.com. This meeting is convening by video conference via the Zoom app as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join and comment. Please note that the meeting is being recorded and that some are participating by video conference. And accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along the posted agenda unless the chair notes otherwise. <clears throat> Some ground rules. The chair will introduce each speaker on the agenda and after they conclude their remarks, we'll go down the line of the members inviting each to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please remember to mute your phone or your computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in colloquially with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. Let me point out that I'm dealing with a laptop computer with a modest screen, so I may not be able to see all the members at the same time. So I ask that uh, either Annie Lacourt or Tara Bradley can signal me if someone is trying to uh, get my attention and I don't see it. Each vote will be taken in this meeting, will be, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call. So now let me take the attendance uh, roll call, if I may. Um, please signify your presence by saying here or yes. Grant Gibbian. Here. Shane Blundell. Here. John Ellis. Here. Makaya Healy. Here. Brian Beck. Not here. Arif Padaria. Sophie Migliazzo. Present. Jonathan Wallach. Here. I'm here. Shailene Procrist. Here. Daryl Harmer. Here. Annie LaCourt. Here. Alan Jones. Here. George Koser. Here. Bill Keller. Here. Al Tassi. He is um, in a weird Teams meeting that this invite created, so I'm trying to get him over here now. OK. Uh, Wanda Nascimento. Here. Christine Deschler. Here. Dean Carm. Here. And David McKenna. Here. Tara Bradley. Here. We're also expecting uh, Dr. Elizabeth Holman and uh, Mr. Michael Mason from the Arlington Public School System tonight. I don't know if they're on or not, but um, Tara, if you can note when they arrive that they were they are present at the meeting. Yes. It looks like we also have two. We have uh, Don Seltzer and then we have a 617 phone number calling in. I'm not sure if that's I believe that's uh, D. Okay. Yeah, that's me. I'm remote at okay. the moment. Awesome. Thank you. Who is that? That's Dean. Oh, Dean. Okay. It's Dean. I'm on my phone for the next 15 minutes. Okay. Thank you, Dean. So, um, <clears throat> good evening, everybody. Um, tonight, we're going to have the um, 
the honor of a visit by Dr. Homan and Mike Mason from the school department. They'll be giving us an overview of Arlington Public Schools uh, as, as they're returning to normal, I hope, as we get out of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I, I want to remind you, as pointed out to me by um, Ian Carmen, that this is not a budget review, uh, but rather it's a high level meeting so that the committee can get to know Dr. Homan and Dr. Homan can get to meet various members of the committee. Um, Dean Carmen will be advising us when he anticipates the school committee and school management will be finished uh, with their budget work and prepared to uh, present a proposed budget to us. Following the uh, APS discussion, we'll be hearing from uh, Dave McKenna and Sophie Migliazzo on several of their budgets and from Kaya Healy on the personnel uh, budget and uh, reclassification. Um, finally, I'd like to comment that uh, in the interest of good order and amicable relations, I have transferred the um, amicable relations with all the committee members. I've transferred the responsibility of management of the budget schedule to Tara who will confirm your budget presentation dates and with whom you can directly adjust scheduling as necessary. So, um, I don't know what the time is right now. Oh, that was 7.36. Well, that's faster than I expected. Um, I'm <laughs> normally I'm running over here on the, maybe I, maybe I either started early or I read quickly, or perhaps I edited that, that uh, lengthy uh, introduction by, by a little bit. So does anybody have anything they want to contribute in terms of uh, discussion tonight while we're waiting for Dr. Homan and um, Michael Mason? I'll just comment that I, I, I guess by now you've all seen, but just in case you haven't, um, our governor announced today that there will be an end to the mask mandate in schools at the end of February. And I just think that's a major milestone. Reading that, I thought, wow, it's been two years. And the governor says that it, at, at the end of February, schools, the kids don't have to wear masks in schools anymore. And I just, that's, that's I think really that's great. Awesome. Yeah, that's a, I think everybody's getting excited about the fact that we might be getting back to normal. But, you know, unfortunately, we still have had a fairly large number of people in the state that have had the, the disease and there still are deaths as a result of that, not Absolutely. just in, in, in Massachusetts, but throughout the country and the world. So Absolutely. it's a, still continue to be a difficult situation, but hopefully it's gonna to get to be manageable. It's, um, it's in, oh, I know what, one other thing I wanted to mention. So a, about half of us received reappointments to the finance committee for some term or another, um, you know, pay, depending, depending on how the precincts changed and, and so forth. And so your, your terms, um, and those appointments are associated with the precinct, not with your, not with your prior appointment. So you may have had an appointment for three years last year, and find out that this year you only have a one-year appointment, and that's because the the, um, the the precinct that you're in expires in that period of time. In any event, if you notice the letters that you likely will have received by now from the town clerk's office, you're supposed to. Um, we're all supposed to go in and get resworn uh, into the finance committee, which I did the other day. And I, as uh, just thinking of Shailene's comment, um, this is the first time I've been in town hall in two years, which is <laughs> just somewhat amazing. It's a strange, strange world that we're living in. But I, I, I do encourage you to, to um, uh, go down to town hall and, and then sign in. And then, um, I mean, swear, swear yourself in. And then, um, Tara, um, do you have the list of people who are current on their ethics training? Um, let me get back to you on that. Okay. Well, let's say next week or something like that, or yes. next meeting. Um, we do have a record of who's uh, taken their ethics training. And I believe every two years we're required to take the ethics course and then take an online test, online test. which is um, you're, it's almost impossible to fail because that you can just keep going back until you get it right. But it's something that we're, we're all supposed to do. I see that Michael Mason has joined us. Hello, Michael. Good evening. Good evening. So um, 
if, if you remember, if you all remember what your, uh, if anybody remembers that they have to take an, an ethics course because they didn't take it last year, then, uh, you know, please go ahead and start on your own. But meanwhile, Liz will, I mean, I mean uh, Tara will come back to us with um, um, the stack. So, Michael, how are things over at APS? Very good. Good. Very good today. We're doing very good. well over here and uh, uh, working along on budgets and uh, working on the, uh, the updated uh, COVID protocols and whatnot, hearing that from the governor and uh, trying to figure out what we're going to do next. That, uh, I, I don't know. Shailene just mentioned the governor announced that no more masks in school and as of the end of February. Yeah, they're letting them, the mask mandate expire on February 28th. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I suppose that means that, uh, this is Shailene, hi, Michael. Um, it's possible that Arlington will choose to continue wearing masks, but it just means the state is not mandating it anymore. Is that your take as well? Correct, correct. Yeah. Baby steps. <laughs> yes. Leave it to the local municipalities to determine how to best handle it. Right. So I, don't, I suppose Charlie doesn't want to comment right now on how soon this committee will be back in person. <laughs> I uh, can't wait, actually. I mean, I'm really looking forward to it, but um, I don't know what our town regulations are right now. Um, and, and I don't know I don't know what the status is. Oh, maybe Annie knows this. Uh, the status of the of the the discussions about having um, semi remote meetings or or um, you know meetings that have both in person attendance and remote attendance. Is that so? so the the committee um, produced its uh, near term report for the select board and sent that. Um, set of recommendations to the select board, which I believe was reviewed this Monday. And um, they are definitely recommending that we maintain hybrid meetings. There's been a review of what spaces and what kinds of technology would go in those various spaces to facilitate what kinds of meetings based on sort of what committees use what rooms. And um, then there's also some recommendations regarding how to produce equity in a remote meeting. Um, so I would suggest that perhaps we could get, if I can get that report to Tara, she could distribute it to the committee members. That'd be great. That'd be real. Um, the, it, it, it's not without cost, but uh, uh, we believe that the ARPA funding can cover the capital investment once it's determined exactly what that is. Um, but it would require some staffing and training of uh, people running committees to learn how to use the equipment. So, good. Well, it's relevant for us. If you can get that report to us, that'd be great. Dr. Yep. Holmes, I see that you're on here. I just saw you a minute ago. There you are. Good, good evening. evening. How are you? Good. How is everybody? Well, we're pretty good so far. <laughs> it's early yet, you know. <laughs> So Dr. Homan and Mr. Mason have joined us. Um, and we're, I, I think I can speak for the entire committee that we're delighted that you're here this evening. And thank you for sending out an advanced copy of your presentation. It looks very interesting. So I think uh, without further ado, we'll pass the baton to you and um, you can proceed. And Tara, are they enabled on um, screen, share, screen sharing? Uh, yes, yes they are. Okay, great. So Dr. Holman, please go right ahead. Fantastic. Thank you all for having me. Good evening, members of the Finance Committee. You should be able to see my screen. Can I get a thumbs up if you can see it? Yes. Um, and Mr. Mason, the uh, Chief Financial Officer for the uh, Public Schools, and I are happy to be here and to give a little bit of an introduction to some of the things we have been up to this year and for me to have an introduction to all of you, which is wonderful. I really appreciate the invitation. Um, we won't go into the details, obviously, of uh, the proposed budget, process, uh, budget for this year for the schools. We'll be back later, and you all can ask us questions about that at that point. Um, but I think some of our goals for tonight are just to introduce and describe a bit about the entry process that I've gone through and getting to know 
uh, members of the town. Some of you I've had the opportunity to meet, some of you even face to face, which is great. Um, some of you via Zoom. I also would like to share some of the things that are driving and informing our next steps for resource allocation for the district. Um, in my first seven months, I've learned a lot about uh, what it is that are priorities for our families, for our students, and some of the directions we need to go next. So I'll share some of that. Um, share some operational data that are also informing our next steps and answer any questions when we're done. We'll move through slides quickly so that we can get to questions that folks have. Um, so I'll start with an overview of my entry process. Um, I started on July 1st, uh, 2021 in the district. I'm coming from Waltham where I was the assistant superintendent of curriculum and instruction. Um, and I engaged in an entry plan that had three phases and now we're looking into phase four, which is the fun part where we get to use the findings to look ahead to what's next for the schools. Um, the phases really started actually in February of 2021. The school committee gave me um, a wonderful transition contract that allowed me to begin engagement while I was still in my former role so that I could get to know the community a little bit better, get to know my administrative team um, and work with Dr. Bodie on a smooth transition, which was very appreciated. In phase two, I spent a lot of time doing meet and greets with town leaders, community stakeholders, um, doing some planning for fall 2021. We had an interesting start to the year because the Delta wave was hitting us uh, and we needed to make sure we had a comprehensive plan in place to get all of our kids back in the schools, which was very successful. And we've enjoyed having everybody back in person. And then in the most recent phase this fall, I've been spending a lot of time out in schools, uh, a lot of time with faculty and staff and families doing listening sessions and focus groups. Uh, we've implemented some surveys for students and families, and I've been sort of wrapping up my entry planning process. The next step I'll talk about a little bit more in a few minutes, but it really is about looking forward and making sure that we're integrating the findings from the entry plan into the work that we're doing to lead the public schools. So I'd also like to share some of the district improvement goals for this year that have been driving my work as the superintendent. Um, early in my entry process, uh, we really became committed as an administrative team um, to building a collaborative and equity focused leadership culture so that we're all sort of speaking the same language about what we expect to see in our schools and in instruction, and that we understand what it means to make decisions that foster equity for all of our students and that reduce access barriers to resources for all of our students. Um, another goal for the district this year is to improve and streamline transparency. Um, sort of using data to make sure that we're explaining why it is we're making particular decisions to improve family engagement and communication. Um, and part of the process of this has been making sure that we're ready to communicate any swift changes to um, COVID-19 guidelines or protocols or testing programs, which have really occupied a lot of our attention this school year. Um, we've got a little bit of feedback. Sorry. Can everybody make sure they have their microphones turned off, please? Including me. <laughs> um, and then the last district goal is for this year is to make sure that we're supporting a safe and supportive pandemic return and recovery. Like I just said, our attention has been um, stretched across trying to be proactive and making sure that we're reacting to changing policies and procedures that are coming from the state, from Mass Department of Health, and um, in collaboration with our local Department of Public Health. I think we've had a really successful year. We had the highest pediatric uh, vaccination rate in the state um, in November and December, which was very exciting. And it's a testament to the collaborative uh, relationship that we have with town departments and something I've really enjoyed since I came to Arlington. So I want to talk a little bit about what we're seeing in our academic um, in our academic outcomes. And, and these things are things that really will drive some of our decision making around the budget for this year. A big one is that we notice that we do have an impact from the pandemic, particularly, and what, what I'm showing you here is math, um, but really it's across academic subjects uh, when you look at the results from 2019 to 2021. So on the graph here, um, this on the left, you'll see the results for grades three to five in blue, grades six to eight in red, and then grade 10 in um, yellow. And then this on the left of the three bars are 2019. And on the right, the three bars are 2021. We didn't have a 2020 year for achievement because we didn't take the MCAS that year. Um, but what you'll notice is that from 2019 to 2021, our students in grades three to eight had a slip in mathematics. In ELA, we held pretty stable, which is great. 
um, in terms of achievement, but we of course want to see our students improving. We definitely don't want to see them slipping. And so we know that there has been a, a relatively significant impact in mathematics on student achievement, especially in grades three to eight, and that that's going to continue to be seen throughout their time with us into grade 10 um, and beyond. So we want to make sure that we're allocating resources to support intervention so that our students can make up for some of the lost time, particularly in mathematics. Um, and then on the right hand side, what you'll see is something else that we look at quite closely, which is the achievement gap between our students. Um, in this particular graph, you're seeing our students who uh, have identified as black and our students who are white in red, our students who are black, their achievement is represented in blue. And you'll see that that is a gap that is present, um, not only present, but also growing. And so we wanna see those lines come together over time and also both of them to go up. And so it's concerning to us when we see those trend lines separating more over time. Um, and going down. And so those are things that we look at closely across every disciplinary area, uh, across multiple years, across grade levels, and do a lot of analysis around at the start of the year that helps us inform our planning and our priority setting as a district and also for our school improvement plans. Something else academic that we're noticing, this is ELA uh, performance on some of our formative assessments that we do. And we did formative assessments in 2020 because we didn't have the um, benefit of doing MCAS so we could monitor those scores. And so these, uh, this chart is showing you the fall 2020 assessment um, for grades three and then four in this column and then grade five. And it's showing you 2020 compared to 2021 for our young learners in multiple domains of literacy. So I'll explain this a little bit slowly because there's a lot of information here. Um, if you look at fall 2020 and 21 in the yellow areas, you'll see that there's an impact from the time when students were in hybrid and remote instruction in fall of 2020 to fall of 2021, students in the same grade were noticing a slip there. Um, and particularly in areas of vocabulary and comprehension of informational texts. And then a little bit as well in phonics for these two earlier grades, third grade and fourth grade, where we expect those phonics skills to begin to be pretty solidified. And so this gives us some level of concern with regards to COVID impacts for sure, but also when we look at curriculum, because we wanna make sure that we're setting our students up to build vocabulary and content knowledge over time and setting them up to be able to critically read informational texts over time. And so some of the things that will come out of um, these data and our planning in the next several months is a look at a continued look at foundational literacy and what ELA curricula we're using so that we can make sure we're using the best curricula that aligns with what we know about how students learn to read. Um, and so that we're making sure we have the intervention services necessary to bring some of these slipping areas from fall 2020 to fall 2021 back up. And then when it comes to mental health, we all know that the COVID-19 pandemic has had a pretty big impact on people's mental health and wellness. Uh, that's you know no different for our young kids who have had a very disrupted several years. Little kids, one of the things we know about them is that they thrive on routine. They thrive on um, knowing what to expect. Um, they thrive on you know uh, stable connections with adults who they trust and who show them care and love. And so when we have as disruptive of a last couple of years as we have had, we expect to see elevated um, or even clinical levels of things like anxiety, depression, worry, concern um, that get in the way of students being able to learn. So this, this is intimately connected to what we see happening academically. What you're seeing here are results for our elementary school students on a mental health screener here on the left-hand side. This mental health screener asks students questions about um, their levels of relative worry. Worry is something that young students can express or understand um, as something that happens. And so we ask them a series of questions on the Penn State uh, Worry Questionnaire for Children, which is what this stands for. And that questionnaire sends us results about whether or not students have an elevated level of general anxiety or whether they have a clinical level that requires immediate attention and intervention. We respond to all students who show an elevated or clinical level, but we don't quite have the staffing required to respond at the rate that students reported an elevated or clinical level in grade five. And we just did the grade four assessment recently. 
this year. So thinking through to next year, we want to make sure that we have the resources necessary to respond when students report uh, such high levels of general anxiety and concern um, for us. At the middle school level, similar to sorts of mental health screeners demonstrated that our middle school students are doing a little bit better with regards to um, elevated um, mental health challenges, but uh, there are still a significant number of students, obviously, who are presenting with clinical or elevated levels of mental health, anxiety, or depression. We've also had 251 instances of needing to refer family, staff, and students to external counseling services this year, and we're looking into various resources that will continue to support SEL and mental health that are listed here, including partnerships with um, collaboratives and outpatient services and continued screeners and assessments to make sure we're tracking and responding to mental health needs. So. With all of that said, on the educational side of things, I'm going to rely on my operational guru in the district and have um, Mr. Mason talk to you about some of the things on the operational side of things that are driving some of our budgetary considerations for next year. Michael, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you, Dr. Holman. And uh, once again, thank you, uh, Finance Committee members, for uh, giving us the opportunity to speak with you this evening. Um, our operational priorities also include a student enrollment um, and what we anticipate for students that we will need to serve over the upcoming years. So, uh, and what uh, is challenging about uh, the enrollment uh, is, is actually predicting enrollment after the pandemic. Uh, prior to the pandemic, it was simpler to project enrollment because it was consistently growing. Uh, the district saw consistent enrollment growth since 2008. Um, from 2008, the district was uh, around uh, 4,756 students. And the, the peak before the pandemic, uh, the district hit total students, 6,128 students. So if you're keeping count, I know some of you guys are, are, are math people in here, um, that's about 1,372 students that the district grew over the 11 year period, which was close to 30% growth um, over that period. However, as you can see from the chart as well, is that the district's law students um, in fiscal 21 or um, fiscal, fiscal 21, um, which was during the midst of the pandemic. Um, however, we've begun to recover uh, that enrollment, which you'll see is around 5,793 students in district only, that does not include out of district. And um, what's difficult about projecting it is this, is that currently um, our, form, our formula would project uh, lower numbers than our current enrollment, which you'll, you'll see uh, that we're seeing around 5,931 in district. Um, and, those, and that number is higher than even our contract vendor projecting projection, lower than our previous contract vendor uh, who uh, did the production prior to the pandemic. You can go to the next slide. Um, yep. Uh, our, our other operational priorities uh, revolve around uh, salary and per pupil spending. So um, feedback we have gathered um, from our school committee members, parents and staff throughout the district is that uh, we need to increase and make our pay more competitive to our comparable districts. Um, so you'll see that the chart on the left um, it says APS teacher and paraprofessional pay relative to average. It shows that uh, as, as a result from a salary study that a contracted vendor conducted for the town of Arlington using fiscal 20 data. Um, so uh, Arlington and other municipalities that are in the town manager 12 that is compared to. And our teacher compensation is up to 5.5% uh, lower than the, the town manager 12 average. Another group that's uh, substantially below uh, the average is our teacher uh, teaching assistants or our para paraprofessionals, which are up to 41.4% below the town manager 12 average. What this chart doesn't show on the left is that uh, there, are other, there are other pressures as well that are communities that are geographically close to Arlington that we are also substantially below. And a lot of our, our staff do uh, compare us to those districts and leave uh, sometimes our district to go to those communities for higher compensation. On the, the, the chart on the right, it shows our per pupil spending averages uh, from fiscal 16 to fiscal 20. And 
what the, the trend continues from the, the, the chart on the left is which shows that, you know, the uh, Arlington Public School spending is below per pupil, the town manager 12 average. And that's one of our concerns and one of our main priorities to look at uh, how we can support our students greater uh, with funding that we currently have. If you can move to the next slide. And our last but not least, um, in terms of operational priorities is that the Arlington High School uh, project, uh, we are about to finish the first phase of that project, um, of the four phase project. And so what you'll see is the picture to the left on this slide was taken last fall. This is the picture of the Massachusetts um, uh, Ave main entrance. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen it. Uh, it, it, it includes a view of what was an unfinished discourse lab. And then what you'll see is the picture to the right is a picture of our student council at the high school in that finished discourse lab. Um, and so we're excited to open up uh, the new uh, uh, performing arts and STEAM wings on February 28th, which is part of the first phase. However, there's still a lot more work to do. We have a phase two, which is a much more complex phase of the projects. There's um, quite a, a work to do with the concerns with the moves in the temporary phase of the project and the upcoming phases. Uh, thank you. All right, so just to wrap us up, um, some of the things that we have that are coming up for us, we are in the process of getting started with a district-wide equity audit. That's going to help us take a look at everything in the system from our hiring practices to uh, like how we um, think about facilities maintenance all the way to curriculum and instruction and professional development and give us a lens on what some of the things are that we can do to improve equity for our students across the district. We are also in the process of launching an inclusive district strategic planning process um, in the partnership with and uh, resourced by the Arlington Education Foundation. We've received um, a wonderful grant from them to help us bring many community members in across stakeholder groups to help us build out what our priorities will be and what our mission and vision will be and if, whether or not we wanna update the one that Arlington Public Schools currently works with, or if we want to have a sort of new visioning of what our post-pandemic schooling experience should look like for students, that's what that group's going to be doing this spring. We're going to continue assessing our facilities needs as enrollments level off in the coming years and making sure that some of our beautiful and new and added on to schools continue to be that way. And we're looking forward to continuing to collaborate with town officials to make sure that we're providing students, families, and staff with what they need and planning for what we know will be a future override campaign. And we're continuing assessment of student learning as we always do and take, keeping an eye on the mental health needs and uh, learning impacts based on the um, ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, which you know it's looking like is things are getting better. So we're really appreciating that. Um, and that is all we have for you. I will stop sharing my screen. We're happy to answer any questions that the committee has for us. Looks like Jonathan Wallach had his hand up first. Thank you, Dr. Holman. Um, that was really uh, very interesting and inspiring. And, uh, Jonathan? This, thank you, Charlie. And uh, thank you, Dr. Holman, for that presentation. I was wondering if you could actually share your screen again. Sure. Um, because the I noticed that the enrollment slide um, is a little different than what had been distributed to us. Mm -hmm. Could you just explain the, the two stars, Mike? Yes. Um, so this slide, I'll, re, I'll restate that this slide is a slide of uh, in district enrollment only. Um, and so what you'll see is I highlighted two numbers. Every year we submit to the state of Massachusetts uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education uh, our student data. And we certify that data and it's certified as of an October 1 date. So the 5,793 uh, figure that you see, that is the actual October 1 certified date. However, after October passes, we still, we're still open for business. We still allow students to enroll into our schools. And our current enrollment 
as of January 25th, 2022, was 5,931 students, which is substantially higher than the certified number submitted to the state. Mm. And so, and, and what was the, the peak um, in the, FY20 there? What so the mean? peak, the, yes, yeah, so the peak was at, at um, for total students, which would exclude, what this number excludes is out of district students. So what I spoke about earlier was the number was 6,128 students, which was total students. Uh, special, uh, the out of district students at that time was a, about 108 students. So it would be less of 108 students. So it was about 6,020 students that were in district. So is it fair to say that enrollment has pretty much bounced back to where it was at its peak? I mean, I'm just looking across the two from the star to the peak on the curve there. Yeah, I mean, yes, we're close to bouncing back to where we were before the, before the pandemic. Great, thank you. Shailene. Yes, thanks, hi. Um, I was struck by the uh, equity graph and I'm assuming that the difference between white and black is representative of other underrepresented groups as well. Like mm -hmm. you're just giving us some basic data to look at. So part of me as an educator wants to know well, what about other groups, are they also um, declining? But my question, it, I'll let that one go because we're trying to focus on finances here uh, or implications for resources. Um, my question is, it seems to me in looking at this, you're going to be making plans soon for how to mitigate these effects. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not a surprise that there's an impact from COVID. Um, in making plans to mitigate the effects, do you think you'll be doing more of the same services? Is it just a matter of more students needing services or will you need to add other kinds of services we haven't offered before? So I'm thinking of summer reading services because you are showing us language arts. Um, so my question is really, it, it, uh, if you know already, maybe you don't know yet, if it's a matter of just more volume of students needing services or whether you think you'll need to offer other interventions. And then the follow-up question, I'll just put it out there, is whether there's similar data about math. Oh, I guess we do see math on the left, but okay, so go ahead. So this one, yeah, this one is math. Um, I can say, yes, we do see similar trends in terms of gaps with students who have IEPs, with students who are high needs, with students who come from low-income families. Um, interestingly, we don't see the same gap in particular with our students who identify as Hispanic. Um, that gap actually has been closing. And so that's worth us investigating further and finding out why, what's been successful in those cases. Um, I'll stop sharing here real quick. Uh, the what I do think is going to be important, and this is something we've been talking a lot about, is that if we continue to do more of the same or more, like just sort of add it, continuing to add services on without doing an assessment, which is why the equity audit is going to happen, of how we're structuring those services and how we're organizing ourselves with the resources we already have, then you really risk actually making the gaps worse. And so what we're going to start with is that assessment of how can we reorganize ourselves? And this actually is a good way to sort of fiscally think about resources as well. How are we organizing the resources we already have to make sure they reach the largest number of students? And this is really important that we're not pulling students out of core instructional time um, or denying them access to what their peers get access to because we're offering them these additional services. Because when you do that, you exacerbate the gap, you make it worse because um, you're, you're denying access to something that students should otherwise have. And so step one is to really assess how we've organized ourselves. And if we need to do restructuring to do some of those things, that does take resources because it takes people's time. Um, it takes a lot of conversation. Oftentimes those changes are the hardest ones to make. It can be easier to slap additional on top of what exists and harder sometimes to restructure what's already there. But we know that that is probably going to be the thing that is most likely to close the gap. So we're starting there. Right, and then uh, with, sorry, some short follow-up, with the, what have we heard is a uh, hiring issue throughout the whole country in all sectors. Um, I'm assuming part of your resources is people and are you finding, maybe you haven't tried to hire yet, but like, are is that an issue for APS is finding the people resources to, to fill these needs? 
Absolutely. One of the hardest areas to hire in right now is special education, which is where some of our greatest needs exist. And so if we can make the resources that we have better and stronger, um, instead of trying to seek out resources that are extremely hard to come by right now, then that could be a better source of um, our energy. And by better and stronger, you mean um, training the staff you already have? Professional development, reorganizing staff we have so that we're utilizing them effectively and making sure that students have access to the providers that they need. Yeah. Thank you. Any, that's it, Shailene? Uh, that's all for now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Daryl. Uh, Dr. Harmon, thank you very much for the presentation. I was wondering if you could uh, share your screen again and go to the slide uh, that I think that it was the Penn State Worry questionnaire. So um, I, one thing that struck me is since the, the wide variance um, that appears to be in the sort of the extent of worry, I guess, is that if that's the metric, um, mm -hmm. you know, ranging from bracket, which uh, I went to as a, in grade school, um, uh, at thirty-eight percent, all the way up to Dallin at fifty-eight percent. Um, so one did. Are these numbers concerning to you? And then two, is there, is there an easy explanation for the wide variance? Um, first, yes, these numbers were, were very concerning to me and to our principals and to our service providers, in part because we're, when we do a screener, it's imperative that we respond to the results that we get and that we have an intervention ready and in place. Um, and we didn't have, we weren't expecting the levels to be this high. What we see from bracket is actually what you might expect the levels to be. Um, you, you know, with young children, they are always going to have some level of uh, worry about school, about you know their experiences at school and at home. Um, and to have approximately, you know, really 38 is still pretty high, but to have approximately a quarter of students who are demonstrating some level of needing additional um, intervention in this area is not very uncommon. Uh, the, the range up to like 58% or up to half is something that um, made us think, okay, we're not able to respond to this in like just logistically in the way we might in a normal year. And so we need to think about it holistically. How are we responding to this in every aspect of how we engage with our students? How are we responding to this during a math lesson, for example? Um, how are we recognizing when students are experiencing a heightened level of anxiety and being able to better notice that as educators? So those are some of the conversations that are happening um, now so that we're not only responding to this in the way that we might have typically, which is to give students counseling groups. Um, what is important to note here though, is that we have uh, programs for students, um, special education programs, specifically at some schools. Dallin is one, Hardy is one. Um, we do have a program at Brackett, but it's being phased over to Hardy. And we have one at Pierce um, and another one at Stratton. And particularly at Dallin and Stratton, those special education programs, which are substantially separate programs, um, are programs where you might actually expect to see some of these elevated or clinical levels of uh, concern amongst those students. And so that could be, and one of the things that's impacting the variance that you see between schools, um, we look at this up against other data as well. So, you know, does this track with academic data? Does this track with survey data that we, we do comprehensive surveys with our communities and ask our parents to give us feedback? Um, if we see a trend somewhere, is this trending with regards to school climate or parent engagement with us or other things that we're seeing so that the school can build priorities around this proactively for next year. Um, so that's one way that we respond. But yeah, the range was surprising. Um, the response needed to be adjusted. We actually hired in an additional coordinator for services during the middle of the school year so that we could respond to this. Um, who we plan, and we plan to keep that role on for next year, just so that we can continue to coordinate the response to things like this. And we're considering using some of our ESSER dollars, our grant money that comes from the state um, for COVID response to add some social workers over the next couple of years, just so we have a heightened number of providers who we can you know, send students to when we have results like this and we have a response plan for that. Hope okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Daryl. Al Tosti.
Al Tosti? I am asking him to yes, unmute. Um, apologize for not showing my face. For some reason, Zoom seems to have knocked out my camera. But uh, could you go back to the enrollment numbers? Mm -hmm. Now, I just was a little confused by what you were saying here. Um, is six, in 2019, I guess that was the peak year, you said there was 6,020 students not counting uh, out of district. Is that correct? Um, that's what. Oh, correct. correct. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And right. How many out of district students were there? At that there time, should have, there should have been around 108 students, if my memory serves me correct. I can. Uh, okay. Now, do we know how many students were in January of that year as opposed to October? Um, not at this moment. I there's, but there are snapshots that we do submit to the DESI, which have occur actually in March and then again in June of that year. Um, I could pull those numbers up, but not at this very moment do I have an answer for you to be looking for that. I, I just want to make sure we're doing apples and apples. Mm -hmm. And the other question is the 5,931, is that include out of district students or is that just in? That is just in district students. Okay. So the 6,020 and the 5,931 uh, are just in district students. Correct. Okay, so we're about 90 short of, of what we were at that time. Um, would you usually gain students or lose students from October to January in a normal year? We, we do normally gain students um, throughout the year, but not the level that we've gained this year. Okay, so if you could uh, maybe shoot us an email what the January 2000 19 or 20 peak year, uh, I'd appreciate it. Just, you know, so like I said, we have apples and apples. Um, could you put up the uh, salaries chart? Of, of each of these, where are most of the teachers? Our, most of our teachers are, are in the masters and the masters 15 range. So are you thinking 50, 60, 70%? I would say uh, probably closer to 50 to, to 60% are in the master's, the master's 15 range. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Al. Um, anybody else have, uh, Shailene for the second time, unless there's somebody else who, who's got their hand up that hasn't been recognized. I think John Ellis, did you have your hand up before? I took it down, thanks. Okay, Shailene. Yeah, thank you. Um, actually stay on this slide because my question was also about teacher salaries. Um, it looks like you maybe do this assessment of the other 12 towns every year. It, if you do it annually, totally understandable that it wasn't done in 2021. Um, when is the next time you're planning to do that look across towns? And then my other question is um, if it, it, whether you feel like there's been a loss of teachers possibly due to salary. I know that's hard to, to guess based on exit interviews or something, but like, are we losing teachers to other towns? So this is based on a town salary study that was done in 2020. It's not a yearly thing. Uh, we do like they had to um, have a vendor come and do an analysis of all the salaries across the, these communities in our community. Um, and it's a pretty comprehensive process. I'm not sure. I don't know, Mr. Mason or Mr. Foskett, if you know when the last time we did something like that was or what the typical I, cycle is for that. I believe it's every three years they do the salary study. Okay. Um, so, and I, speaking to, you know, do we lose teachers due to considerations around salary? Um, I think it's more common that we lose candidates during the hiring process. And I've been here only seven months, but I've witnessed that happening, um, where they have multiple offers they may be weighing and salary plays a role in their consideration of whether or not to come to Arlington. 
Um, and that, yes, certainly when you don't have as competitive of salaries and another opportunity opens up in a community where you may be paid more, um, that that can be compelling to some educators. It depends on things besides salary, of course. So we try to have very good working conditions for our teachers, and that does keep a lot of people in Arlington. We have very good uh, retention in Arlington, and that's a testament to the strength of the system. Um, however, it would be lovely, and it is really important for diversity hiring, actually, to have very competitive salaries, because it is extra extraordinarily hard to diversify the teaching pool, particularly when we're um, neighbors with communities like Cambridge um, and you know, so close to Boston, for us to hire diverse candidates when we don't have as competitive of salaries. And that's been a major priority stated by members of the community. Thank you. George Koser. Thank you. Um, thank you for a great presentation, Dr. Holman. It's very much appreciated. Uh, could you quickly comment on what the issues in terms of achievement and mental health are at the high school level? You didn't mention that, but just is it comparable to the lower grades or is it perhaps less or more? What I will pull up if we go back um, is what you'll notice on this slide that you write, I didn't talk about it a lot. There's a lot of um, grades three to eight, but if you look at grade 10 on the math achievement, it was pretty level from 2019 to 2021. And that's been true for the data we've looked at for the high school is that it's been fairly level in terms of achievement. Um, what is What does not stay level um, is mental health needs. We actually have seen a pretty significant surge of, of mental health challenges amongst our high school students this year. And that, you know, is, as an educator, I can say that's relatively attributable to the fact that during a really critical phase of their development, particularly for like this year's ninth graders, uh, a stage where social interaction is part of how their brains are developing. Um, and they've been denied a lot of that that we're seeing more students who are at a particularly clinical or very elevated or crisis level of um, mental health challenge and needing more counseling services, needing more referrals services available to us so that we can make sure we're addressing that. And more parents coming to us saying, I'm really worried about my child's ability to engage. So that will over time have an impact on things like academics, um, but also because these kids were through a lot of their academics by the time they reached the pandemic, we're not seeing the same kind of pandemic slip um, for them in terms of the academics, just on the mental health side of things. And last question is, I presume you expect to adjust the enrollment projections. And I'm just wondering when you might be doing that. And is that going to be another outside consultant or whether you might possibly try to do some of that in-house or just it's a, it's a tough thing we appreciate, and but it, it drives the finances. So I'm just curious if you've thought, had a chance to think about that. Uh, Mr. Mason, I'll let you answer that one as the person <laughs> who does our internal projections so, be so beautifully. <laughs> Go ahead. So um, I, I, I do these, I normally do these projections annually. I do intend to uh, do another one this year, but we, it does not uh, get reported to the town or as part of any kind of uh, financial planning for the town. We won't do that until the following October, which will then true up our actual enrollment numbers. Uh, so if these students will be enrolled in October 1 of next year, we will then be counting those students then, and then we'll be considering them in the, the formal projection going forward to, to keep using the apples to apples comparison of using the October certified numbers as our data points. And if you find that this year's jump from October to January really is uncharacteristic, do you know if you're gonna to need to try to adjust for that next year or is your guess at this point, I'm pushing on you a little bit, but mm -hmm. these numbers matter. Um, you know, is your guess that maybe that jump might go back to historic levels? And I understand we'll know more in October, I'm just, curious how difficult this is all looking to you at, at the moment. Based on us, you know, when I first initially looked at the decline from the pandemic and looked at survey data that was sent to the, the families of exited students, um, it was apparent that students were going to return 
at later times as families felt uh, more secure in the in what we were providing for safety protocols for due to the COVID-19. Um, I think that's that's what we're seeing is that families are starting to return and feel secure about that. And I think we'll start we'll still see uh, some other students return even in next year's uh, uh, school year because uh, some students went to private schools and they're waiting to wait till the next grade change or school change to bring the students back. And that was also indicated in the survey. So um, I do believe that the same unprecedented exit of students leaving at the start of the pandemic, we're, we're not going to see a normal historic reduction of students because of the students returning, but normal, we're going back to the normal progression of enrollment that we had prior to the pandemic. Thank you. Dean Carmen. So as we, as I think we're sort of winding down right now, um, so I, I really have more of a, a comment that I'd like to, or observation I'd like to share with the committee um, as one of the three people that, that reviews the school budget. And um, the observation is, I would say I've been, as an observer during school committee meetings on YouTube and or ACMI and whatnot, and the budget subcommittee, I, I've been very impressed with Dr. Homan's approach towards um, taking over as superintendent. And, and the thing I've been most impressed about, and you all got to see it tonight, is, is that she immediately recognized that we have a structurally sound district that does have some issues that need to be worked on, but it's structurally sound. And so in her work moving forward, she's gone after the problems, right? Like I think sometimes when you take over in a leadership role, there's this idea that you're just gonna blow everything up and, and imprint your, your mark everywhere. And, and she's really had the wisdom to not do that. She's had the wisdom to assess where the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats are. And she said, look, these are strengths. I'm not gonna break them. And these are problems and we're gonna deal with them. And that's been great. I mean, it's really made the transition smooth. It, it's been, I mean, it, it's been great. Now, that being said, not everything is perfect, okay? Because she does refer to me in emails as Mr. Carmen. And for you all know me, and you've now seen how great she is. And for her to dignify me with that title, I'm going to, I'm going to convince her that I am Dean and she is Dr. Holman. And that's how it's gonna be. It's going to take the whole year. It's going to probably take next year. But the more she gets to know me, the more she'll understand it. So thank you. I'll call you Dean when you call me Liz, Dean. <laughs> Under no shirk. I, when I met Dr. Holm, I told her there will never be a circumstance while I will refer to her by that name in any forum. So there we are. Dr. Thank Holman, you, Mr. Mr. Carmen. We appreciate your comments. I appreciate it, Mr. Carmen. Thank you. <laughs> Grant Gibbon. Thank you, uh, Charlie. Um, yeah, I had a question about the need for um, counseling services and is there any um, connection or use um, between the um, need and the, uh, are the Arlington the youth counseling services uh, that we have here in town? Yeah, we have an agreement with them and we do refer services out to them pretty routinely. And we actually have them come in during parts of the school day as well. So they offer great services that we use to supplement um, often with our students and families. So. Very good, thank you. We can take advantage of as many partnerships as we possibly can. Other questions? Well, if I may, uh, Dr. Homan, uh, I have, three questions and one is going back to the the the, the slide that had the uh, the different grades on one side the equity on on the other and i think there was one slide that had five years as opposed to just a couple of years with respect to um uh, covid and there was a decline that's the one yes there was a decline of, of um, achievement starting in 2017, going up to 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just wondering if there's any, as 
does anyone have any reason to, to uh, or any suggestion as to what the reason for that might be? Um, I think, you know, this is, yes, you're seeing a little bit of a decline. I mean, I think it's important to take a look at, so overall, this is actually pretty stable in part because if you look at the scores and achievement for our white students, you go from 508.4 in 2017, and this is their sort of um, like raw scaled score on MCAS to 510.7 in 2019. There's a slight increase from 2018 to 2019, um, but then there's the dip in 2021. So you're seeing the pandemic impact sort of pull that line down, okay. whereas it was stable up until then. And it's relatively stable, like from 487.3 to 487.6 is actually a slight increase for our, for our African-American students from 2018 to 2019. And then it gets pulled down by the pandemic. Um, so what we'll watch for over the next few years, like we will always look at multi-year forecasts for performance. And we do this in, so our ad, admins analyzed all of this in preparation for building their school improvement plans over the summer. Next year, we're hoping to include teachers in that institute so that they're part of the planning and priority driving. Um, we also include school councils in this so that they're looking at this data and they're saying, okay, we really want the schools to focus on this problem area that we see. Um, but what I think is the number one thing to pay attention to over the next few years and that I'm really hoping will have a big impact on is the difference and the room and space between those two lines and we do we make this exact graph for all sorts of different focus groups of students um, and i try not to call them subgroups because sub implies below and really it's that we need to pay attention to what particular groups of students need and make it a focal area and schools need to say we're going to change this um, about how our students are performing but yeah it, it, it's a little misleading on the five-year outlook only because of the impact of the 2019 to 2021 um, it sort of pulls that line down a little more than is accurate. Thank, thank you. I can see now that if we if we cut off 2021, those two lines would be almost flat. So, mm -hmm. and flat's um, not great. We'd like to see them go up. I understand, but I'm just saying that. Uh, mm -hmm. So, the sec second second a second question has two parts. And um, this year, we're seeing an increase in the enrollment at Minuteman and and the uh, um, assessment that we're getting from Minuteman. Um, so, what is your view of the impact of the new Minuteman High School on our enrollment, and um, what do you think the impact of the new high school is going to be on our enrollment? Two parts of that question. Um, so, for Minuteman, I'm I'm new to being in a system that has a separate regional vocational opportunity for students, and that I came from a district that had an embedded regional vocational program in the high school. Um, and I think there are some things that are shifting and moving about Minuteman. It'll be kind of hard to project what we think the impact of that'll be. For example, they just turned over leadership. And so that could have a possible impact in the out years on enrollment. They have not, we have not been able to restore some of our um, programming with Minuteman that allowed our students with disabilities to participate in um, regional voc vocational education, uh, which actually was pretty disappointing to us. We would let, prefer to be able to offer that opportunity to our students with IEPs. I think that it's easier for me to comment on the impact of the new high school on enrollment in that as we are, some of the um, bump in enrollment that you see on that graph uh, for January, a large proportion of that relative to like all of our schools where that enrollment was seen was actually at the high school. Um, and so what that is coming right as we're about to open phase one. Um, and so we anticipate that we will see a lot more enrollment at Arlington High School as this new state of the art facility opens up um, that will probably realize some of that enrollment at the high school for next school year, but that we may even see more of it when phase two opens up in the fall of um, 2023. So um, that we're, we're watching that closely, but the projections actually do account for an expectation that secondary enrollments are going to increase for two reasons. One, the new high school, and two, the fact that enrollment groups that were really like new classes that were really large at the elementary level are now moving through the Audison and are headed into the high school next. Thank you very much. So um, 
one more time, I guess, to ask, are there any other members that have questions for Dr. Holman or Mr. Mason? Well, I don't see any hands. So um, Liz, I'd like to thank you very much for coming tonight. Mike, thank you for coming. It's been a very great, uh, great presentation and we appreciate the time you took to answer all of our questions. Thank you. We very much appreciate the invitation. So thank you for having us. It's been fun. Take care. We'll see you again soon. Yes, we look forward to it. Bye. Good evening. So uh, the next item on the agenda are uh, budgets. And uh, I think first uh, we have uh, David and Sophie. Okay. <clears throat> if you, uh, the first budget I'd like to uh, address is our own budget on page uh, 17. Alan, if I could ask you, Alan Jones, if, could, could you put the budget uh, budget page up on the screen? Um, in, in this budget, our, our own budget, and it's, it's uh, basically, we have uh, a change, but not a change. As you all know, we, we give stipends out to the chairman and the vice chair people, and also to the recording secretary. Well, that position has been taken over by Tara, our, our new uh, executive secretary. So that portion of the stipend of $450 would be um, added to her salary. And um, that's about the only change that we have. Um, if there's any other questions, I don't know, Charlie, if you want to expand on anything on the finance budget or I'll be okay with this. I think the amount was 550. Um, I it was a, I'm sorry, 550, what did I say, 450? Yeah. Yes, it's, yes. It's, it's, it's 550, thank you. No, I, don't ha I don't have any other questions or comments. No. Uh, on the salary side, do um, you want to look at the expenses? Well, the um, the, 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 ex the expenses oh, that, one, that we have is one line. It's, it's one yeah. line, so okay. we're all set there. Uh, and oh, there's no we, change, okay. And there's no change. So with that, I'd recommend uh, that we accept, uh, as presented in the budget book, of, um, budget for the finance committee. Second. So it's been moved and seconded. Um, discussion? Questions? If anybody sees any hands up, I only can see five people here, so. Okay. Nope. All right, then um, seeing that there are no questions, it's been moved and seconded. They will take a roll call vote on Budget number one, FinCom. So, uh, Grant Gibbian? Yes. Shane Blundell? Yes. John Ellis? Yes. Makaya Healy? Yes. Uh, Brian Beck? He's not here. Arif Padaria? He's not here. Um, Sophie Migliazzo? Yes. Jonathan Wallach? Yes. Shailene Pokris? Yes. Daryl Harmer? Yes. Annie LaCourt? Yes. Alan Jones? Yes. George Koser? Yes. Phil Keller? Yes. Al Tosti? Yes. Wanda Nascimento? Yes. Christine Deschler? Yes. Ian Carmen. Yes. And David McKenna. Yes. The um, vote is unanimous amongst the uh, members that are present. Okay. Go ahead, okay. Uh, David and Sophie. The, the next budget um, we're going to ask to put on hold until the 14th, and that's the selectman's budget. Uh, we've met with the um, people, that the staff of the, of the Board of Selectmen, both Sophie and I, and we went over line for line. And there's a couple of questions that still uh, we feel need to be answered pertaining to that budget. So if um, 
but we're going to pass on that tonight. So we're not ready to present it in its full. Okay. So you have to negotiate that with um, the executive secretary. I already have you on for the 14th. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> okay. Town manager budget. Um, the, we, we, uh, Sophie and I met with, um, Sandy and, uh, Julie today and went over the town managers, um, well, Is David for you? Something's happened. Dave occasionally his um he only occasionally freezes. He had warned me, so he's. Do you want to see if he unfreezes, or you? I mean, each year during. Oh, there you go. David, we lost everything you said. You did. Yes. Okay. Well, then we'll start again. <laughs> I don't know why, because I I'm fine. Um, it's uh, on, on the town manager's budget. Sophie and I have met today uh, with both Cindy Pula and Julie Wayman, and um, we went over the, the, the town manager's budget. And um, Julie takes, uh, not Julie, Sophie takes copious notes. So, any questions that you folks might have on, pertaining to this budget? She'll be glad to help you out and, and answer. We've tried to uh, address some of the concerns you've already expressed. And one of them was the town manager's um, new contract in reference to would there be any transfer of funds in the future to, for that contract? And the answer is no. As, as was pointed out today, that contract, actually his new contract, he takes um, a, a little less in salary than he, than he had been receiving. And the one will put a note in, I've asked Alan to put a note in, in the finance report at the town meeting that the um, stipend for housing allowance has been um, dis discontinued in, in his budget, uh, his contract. Questions? Sophie, do you, Sophie, do you, do you want to add anything, Sophie? Nope, I don't think so. Okay, then. Any questions? I'm sorry. I have a, a question. Does anyone, do you know what's in that 24,000, uh, just about 25,000 in the other benefits? Do I know what's, uh, what makes the other benefits? Yes. I, yes, I gather that's that the, the, the 20,000 reduction is, is apparently the housing allowance that's referred to. It was a, yeah, approximately around 24,000 for ho housing. They have, um, I do have a copy of the manager's new contract. And in the contract, it, that's all right. I've got this um, percentage for the raises each year of 1%. He also has, it's, um, this, uh, the, the, Deferred compensation plan that, that, that he's always belonged to. And there's, um, um, there's also money for different things that, that he belongs to, different associations. And um, I'm, I'm trying to go through it page for page, but just long term disability insurance, reimbursement, and, and, and things of that nature. So it's, okay. it, it's pretty, the contract is pretty standard, other than the fact that it's, and when I say standard compared to previous contracts, with the exception of the um, uh, housing allowance being taken uh, out of the contract. And it's a three year contract. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions on the salaries in the town manager's department, which is up, up on the screen right now? Makaya. Uh, I'm just curious about um, the there's no maximum listed, and I'm curious if you know the history of behind that. I think I can answer that, David. 
I mean, this, okay. this is this is a, a negotiated uh, agreement. It's not he's not in a class, right? In a pay plan. It's a it's a sort of a arm's length negotiation. We hope between him and the board of selectmen every year or every three years. Every three years. And and they have to note him, notify him with um, if they have if if. If the intent of the, of the select board that they're not going to rehire him, they have to give him uh, so many months' notice before that six months. And there's a uh, there's a uh, compensation plan built in to the contract for that as well. Should they not decide not to rehire him, or there's another part of the contract that says should he choose to leave, he has to give a minimum of 90 days' notice to the to the board of selectmen. Things of that. So it's, it's standard in the contract. Kayleen. Yeah, thanks. Um, just a quick question about the renegotiation of the contract with uh, the removal of housing um, allowance. Is that uh, a standard, I'm just curious, like is that a standard thing that's happening across towns or Arlington's trimming the budget and that was a way to do it? Uh, well, uh, yeah. Go ahead, again, if, if I could, it's contractual. So uh, three years ago, they they negotiated and they put it in his contract. And three years later, they negotiated and all parties have to agree on this. They took it out of his contract. <clears throat> I, I think it's fair to say that the um, it was originally put in there um, because uh, he, he had moved to Arlington from somewhere else to be in the town. And the cost of housing here, as you, as we all know, is significantly <coughs> higher. In the interim, um, the manager moved to, I think it's Norwood. So um, the compensation for the increased cost of Arlington housing went away. So we could expect this for the next two years, at least, because Adam's going to have a three-year contract now. But then in the future, if a new contract were negotiated, we could see a housing allowance come back. Is that? Yeah, okay? yes. Yes, you could the anything come back. The some things that we don't even realize. Thank you. Any other questions on the uh, town manager budget? I can only see a limited number of boxes here, so speak up. Okay. So, so here and um, I'd like to make a motion that we accept, uh, as written in the budget book, um, the twenty-three. Physical year 23 budget for the town manager's office. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Okay. Um, I'll take the roll call vote. Grant Gibbion. Yes. Shane Blundell. Yes. John Ellis. Yes. Makaya Healy. Same. Sophie Migliazzo. Yes. Jonathan Wallach. Yes. Shailene Pokris. Yes. Daryl Harmer. Yes. Annie LaCourt. Yes. Alan Jones. Yes. <clears throat> George Koser. Yes. Bill. Yes, we'll cover. Uh, Al Tassi. Yes. Wanda Nascimento. Yes. Christine Deschler. Yes. Dean Carmen. Yes. And David McKenna. Yes. Thank you. Uh, the vote is also unanimous on this is budget uh, three, right? Yes. Okay. Um, Go ahead, David. Okay, now we'll go to page uh, fifty-eight for the for the clerk town clerk's budget. And um, I was wondering if my partner want, wants to present portion of this budget. 
I think I'll let you go for it, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Uh, Sophie and I met, met in, uh, we had a, a, a long conversation with the town clerk. Some of the questions that were asked um, at our previous meeting was, um, what was the situation with the uh, in investigating changes in, in, in uh, modernizing the, the town clerk's office? And there is a committee set up um, doing that in conjunction with the town manager and uh, I think Sandy Poehler and, and some other people as well. Um, they've, they're in the process, my understanding is, is hiring a consultant to, um, to look at that, but there's a lot of things going on in the clerk's office um, uh, and it's been very busy and there's also been personnel turnover. In, in the clerk's office as well. And plus our, cl our town clerk is relatively new as we all know. So anyway, um, they're working on, uh, on that. They're also on the um, on a side note, uh, under the town clerk's responsibility is the, there's an election committee that was voted in by town meeting. That committee has d done some recommendations and that committee is due to expire um, at the end of this coming town meeting. Uh, they're the ones that have proposed uh, the different things like the um, rank choice voting and stuff like that. So the, the clerk's office is, has been very, very busy. And in addition to that, the clerk's office has taken over the uh, responsibility, total responsibilities in the budget for the election. So, and they, they've done some, um, Juggling, if you will, putting the, some of the things in their proper categories as far as, it, as far as the budget goes. So I'll, um, I'll go through that. You'll notice that um, salary and in, in wages um, uh, line 5100. There's an increase of 10,003. Um, that has to do with um, Personnel, it, 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 that has to do with some of the cost of hiring people for, for elections. As far as the staff in, in the clerk's office, they operate now with the clerk, assistant town clerk, and two other people in the clerk's office. So, um, and is, the overtime budget stays the same. Advertising, there's an advertising, if you line 5201, uh, there's an increase of a, uh, let's see, increase of, of $1,000. So, um, Uh, advertising in the clerk's office and, and, and in a lot of the other departments, especially zoning and redevelopment, um, the advertising has, has gone up. Things that have to be a advertising along the way. And what the clerk has done is she's tried to um, narrow the, the, the wording in some of these things that have to go into the, the local newspaper. And she's been allowed to do that rather than make making a show out of statement about certain things, which actually is a cost savings. So the, um, one of the things that, that, that were eliminated, there was $150 on election night spent for an IT, per, IT person from um, our, de our, our department, our data processing department would stand by at the um, on election night and that on any election and that that $150 has been eliminated. They, they don't need that that person anymore. So that's another, that's another little change. So with that, I'm just gonna turn it over to you folks that you have questions and see if Sophie and I can answer them for you. Alan Jones. Uh, well, first, David, I think the advertising budget decreased significantly. Right? Yes, I'm sorry. I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to light. It, it actually decreased. And the reason why it decreased is exactly what I said, that she's right. been able to shorten the wording in some of the stuff that goes into the, into the newspaper. 
Okay. Uh, the, the question I had, you mentioned uh, possibly hiring a consultant to look at uh, efficiencies uh, and, and such. I don't see much in the way of expenses for that. Is that, is that funded? Is that serious? It, well, it, it, again, it, it, it's, it's a work in progress, Alan. So I'm not sure at what point they're going to ask for that. Okay. That, well, looks like that, not was, asking a, that was a Warren article last year. Yeah, it's funded under oh, the Warren article. Okay. The okay. Warren Thank article. Thank you. Well, and, and, and then the last question is the $7,000 reduction in printing licenses. We, we uh, Sophie, we took notes on that. We, we, what was that? Yes. So um, that the bulk of that was because that's where they printed the ballots. That was the cost um, used for the ballot printing. And um, something that the clerk has really done an effort in is to make sure things are being uh, spent in the right categories and reported in the right categories. So that's just a transfer. Um, I think if you look on the election, uh, there's probably increase in printing ballots there's right okay because it looks like the actuals in the previous years were actually significant higher than eight thousand so i was wondering how it go from fifteen thousand to a thousand in two years and if that's realistic right. yeah so she's the explanation we're given is if you go to the next page on um election expenses. There's a, there's a new expense that wasn't there before, printing ballots that had zero before. And obviously there were expenses for printing ballots. They were just never put in the right categories. So now there's this 20,000 here for, um, for that. In the, thousand, in the thousand that's left on the other, left has to do with the dog tags, for example. Thank you. That totally explains it. And a, a, another note that, that that I found interesting. Apparently, she's been um, she's been working um, extra hard on c coming up with a policy for dog kennel licenses in the town of Allington. And that's your first glance to say, well, but what's that? I guess the state has a lot of say in that. And um, so she and she's been working that w w with another working group on a kennel license for the town of Allington. Presently, there are no kennel licenses issued in the town of Allington. They were at one time, but none presently. But she's working, she, she kind of smiles herself and working uh, diligently on, on this new policy that we have to have. <clears throat> so that's it. So if, again, if anybody else has any questions concerning this. this Christine, this actually the, Christine. Yeah, yeah. I, I just want clarity as to the reasons the clerk is giving for not as of yet hiring this consultant that we appropriated money for last year. Can you? I I, I wasn't following what it was that you were saying. Why is this happened yet? I, I hear what you're saying, Christine. It, it 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 it's this working group that was formed with with the, like I say, along with the um, the clerk, the town manager, and uh, the deputy town manager, and others. This work, that's why I said this work is in progress. And at some point, yes, the money was appropriated last year, and at some point they will be hiring a consultant. But they haven't gotten there yet. That's our understanding of it. I don't know if that helps you or not, but that's, that's our understanding. I guess I'll just say, if there's a if there's a modernization working group, do we really need a consultant, or vice versa? But I I, I guess I I'm I, going um, beyond. I guess I'm going beyond the scope of your your budget, David. Right. Sorry. I, again, on your concern, I I know that um, when we discussed that article last year amongst at the finance committee, just what you said, just what you asked was said then too. So, but town, town meeting did vote, did vote that that money. I would I would add maybe too. So she she did specifically say that they're in the process of hiring the consultant. I think she also referred to the fact that some things, uh, such as the rank choice, are still stuck at the state at the state level for approval. 
So they're sort of stuck on certain things without being able to move forward until they get approved uh, at the state level. Al Tosti. Yes, thank you. Um, this question is not, well, it's partially on the budget. <laughs> it's the uh, town clerk salary. Um, it, it, just doing a brief review of the other small department heads, uh, small departments, wait a minute. I didn't quite say that correctly, but small departments, the department head, uh, like say the human resources or the assessor's office, which are about the same size, the department heads make a lot more money than the town clerk. And I'm not, this is not a, something we could do in this budget right now, but you know, we're talking 98, 97, $98,000 for the town clerk and both the human resource and the uh, assessor make between 125 and 130,000. Um, used to be many, many years ago, we tried to keep the town clerk and the treasurers you know, about the same because they were the two elected officers and there was nobody else to fight for them except us. Um, well, the treasurer has gone off um, and now also makes 125 to 130,000. Um, but maybe at some point we, we should be looking at the town clerk salary, especially now that a whole new section has been delivered to this person's hands that they're responsible for. Uh, I, I think she is, uh, the town clerk's position is woefully underpaid. Um, if I could just add to that, Alan, um, it, 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 there's also a, a move of a thought process going on to taking the elected position of town clerk, like they've done with other positions, and make that a, a non-elected position uh, under the um, responsibility of the town manager. So that's also um, being investigated. In, in, so with that said, there might be a situation where you, you'll see the a salary of the town clerk, if it had, if it goes to an, an appointed position, that that salary would, would definitely increase at some point down the road. I'm just, you know, whether if that's going to happen, I don't know, and it's going to be a year or two down the road. Right. Uh, in the meantime, she's our most underpaid position. Um. So anyway, I just raised the issue. Very good. Thank you, thank you, Al. I'm sure the uh, taxpayers are on to appreciate your recommendation for increasing expenses. <laughs> um, Shane Blundell. Thanks, Charlie. Just an odd question. What is this appropriate, the eight or seven for stenographers? I guess 8,000. What do we need? What is that role? Town this, meeting. It's just a st stenographer is, that's the role of an, they hire to take the uh, minutes, the exact minutes at um, town meeting. Thank you very much. Okay. Sophie, you have a question. Well, I, I would add back in just to clarify something regarding the move of the elections. So it became clear to us actually in our discussions with the select board um, meeting that elections were originally under the town clerks, which makes sense because that's where voter registration and everything is kept. So elections are probably under town clerk and they were only taken over by this left board, um, I guess as a speaker when there were um, difficulties in, in handling the elections at the historically somehow at the town clerk's office. So it, so it just got taken on as additional work for the staff of the select board. And now it's just being transferred back to its original location at the town clerk's office. Yeah, it, it, you're correct, Sophie. And remember, that was years and years ago because it's been under the, uh, the board of selectmen for quite some time. But you, 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 you're right, that's what they, at one time it was under the uh, responsibility of the town clerk. Christine. I uh, this may be beyond, a little bit beyond the scope, but I just want to follow up on, on what Al Tosti was talking about in terms of the, the, the clerk's salary. I, I have noticed that there are, there's at least one other department head that I've thought her salary was um, 
lower than I would expect. And that was the library director who has a very huge staff. She's responsible for two facilities. Um, she's both uh, public facing, town facing. She reports to a board of trustees as well as friends group. And I was surprised at what her salary was compared to uh, other department heads. Um, I don't know if we have a role, the finance committee has a role in, in reviewing this, but in terms of an equity standpoint, I do think this is an important issue that um, if we don't keep it in mind, if we don't look at it, we should prod other people um, who, who uh, should be doing this. So that, I just wanna throw my two cents in on that issue. Thank you, Christine. Uh, so let me let me make a suggestion, uh, Makaya. Perhaps you can discuss um, with Karen Malloy, the Human Resources Director, um, the issue of both the clerk's salary and the um, and the library salary. As you know, how how that fits in, comp in comparison to other towns and other departments. Uh, I mean, the one issue is that. In either of those cases, if we lose someone because of the salary compensation, that that eventually costs the town money in in recruiting and and and, and any um, losses in service delivery that result from those positions not being filled. So I, I think uh, bringing it to the attention of the human resources director and um, at least can get a conversation started about that. Annual court. Well, I was going to make a glib comment in response to your glib comment about the taxpayers at Arlington, but perhaps I should not do that, given that you've just recommended that Makaya discuss it with human resources. Well, you can make a glib comment if you'd like, if it would make you. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't just okay. do it for my own emotional satisfaction, Charlie. Yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. Uh, I just uh, thought that the. Uh, well, never mind. We're gonna, we don't need to digress there. So, um, any further comments on the clerk's or questions uh, about the clerk's budget? I just wanted to make uh, just a brief. The employees in the clerk's office are all union employees. Oh, we lost you again. Technology. David? Yes. We, we, the last word we heard you say was union employees. And then you, we lost everything you said. Well, after that, there was a, a lot of bad language. So I'm glad you didn't hear it. This, this computer of mine is just fading out on me. Um, the, 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 the four employees in the clerk's office are union, union employees. They, are, they all work by, by union contracts. Okay. The, the employees in the selectman's office do not. They're not, they're non-union. Just to give you some people that have interest in that. Thank you. Okay, with that. Um, Any other questions for, uh, for, for David or Sophie on the uh, clerk's budget? Al Tossi's got his hand up. Does that include the town clerk, David? No, the town clerk is is, is not union. It, it's just the assistant town clerk and the, uh, the 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 other ladies that work. They are union, and it, there's two different unions there. The assistant town clerk is in a different union than the than the other other three. A, a different. Okay, we lost David again. We'll move on. Um, David, can you I hear me? I think I'm. Back. I think I'm back now. Uh, what I'd like to do is make a motion that we accept what is written in the budget book for um, FY23 for the town clerk's off uh, department. Is there a second? Second. Okay. So it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Okay. Uh, begin with the roll call vote on the town clerk's budget. Grant Gibbion. Yes. Jane Blundell? Yes. John Ellis? Yes. Micaiah Healy? Yes. Sophie Migliazzo? Yes. 
Jonathan Wallach. Yes. Shailene Pokris. Yes. Daryl Harmer. Yes. Annie LaCourt. Yes. Alan Jones. Yes. George Koser. Yes. Bill Keller. Yes. Alan Tosti. Abstain. Wanda Nascimento. Yes. Christine Deschler. Yes. Dean Carmen. Yes. And David McKenna. Yes. Okay, we have uh, four, seven, ten, twelve, sixteen in favor and one abstention. So the um, the the budget is passed. Okay. And the next budget, Charlie, would be the election election budget. Okay. On page on page 60 of our uh, budget book. Go right ahead, David. And you'll notice that the, the salaries and wages, that um, that, that, that is because they took over the uh, expenses as far as the people that, are, that work the elections. That, that's in that, that line. It, it gives you 181,995 for FY23. That's that that's three elections for that fiscal year, starting in September. And we do not know at this point, we do not know what the state's going to do as far as early election. We assume they're going to have it. We just don't know for how many days at this point. Um, in line 5208, rental buildings, there's no more. They, they used to rent the uh, Congregational Church up on Park Avenue for Precinct 20, and they don't rent that building anymore. And um, electronic voting equipment, that also includes the clickers at town meeting. And my understanding is that that's, I think the contract is up on that. Um, I believe, or it's, it's going to expire. But that, that, that pays for the clicking. Another thing, just on a side note, for the uh, for capital expense, uh, the town clerk is going to um. Uh, well, she's put in for the, the they call the voting pads. I don't know if you're familiar with them or not, but on early election, the people would be sitting and they had a little pad and it, you'd, you'd give your name. And it was like a, it's a way of signing in to vote rather than the old way of the voter list and, and someone taking a number two pencil and drawing a line through it. She's she's put in for that for 17 more, um, for one for each precinct. And um, that's in the, in, in the capital. She's put in for that. So uh, under the uh, electronic equipment. And also for the, the clickers at town meeting. Annie? Yes, yeah, so I, I understand the difference then in the electronic voting equipment costs and I understand the printing costs. The other purchase services, um, looks like that budget is increasing by about $10,000 and comes a little closer to matching the actuals. Any idea what's in that category, Dave? Sophie, did we, did we take notes on that? We did. Um, so this was, I'm sorry, Annie, you said the line number is 5236, right? 5236. So there were two aspects. One is um, it's a consolidation, and it now includes the cost of the constables uh, for town meetings and elections that are required. And those were not in that bucket before, they were elsewhere. Um, the other item is $3,000 for an accessibility for the blind to vote by mail, they had to hire a, a specialized company now that allows this requirement for accessibility to vote when blind. Got it. 
Any other questions on this budget? Uh oh. I see any hands up. Yes, Shane. Thanks, Charlie. Just want to make sure I understand. So the the reverberation in salaries and wages every year, that's because the odd year FY budget has an even year calendar year. So we're have a state election. I'm just looking because I'm looking at 2021 versus 2023. And that's a difference of like forty five thousand dollars. Is there I get that it fluctuates, but like why does it it's a it's a lot bigger than our last election in twenty twenty two? Our last election, we only had one election, the town election, in, this, in the budget cycle. We didn't yeah, have it. We, we did ask her, I, I asked her specifically that question, and she said part of what we're seeing, though, is the inconsistently uh, inconsistency prior to her arrival of it being paid out of different buckets as well. So you can't really compare, you can't be sure of that number. Okay, thanks. Kayleen? Yeah, on the tablets, the electronic voting equipment by um, some sort of iPad, it sounds like, where you, you sign in yourself instead of a volunteer signing you in and another volunteer signing you out. Have we piloted that or is this $10,000? It looks like, it's, I don't know if the whole 10,000, but this amount of money, is it, um, is it to pilot this or is this like an investment? Shailene, we've used these. Um, we've used these in early voting, the last um, last two times. So, um, so it's already been piloted, if you will. So now, now what the town clerk wants to do is is to take um, and and put them in every precinct for every election. So there'll be one per precinct. So instead of having, you'd only need one person to uh, to operate the the little the, the pad. And, Somebody comes in, gives their last name, and the keys right up there. Um, what information they need. Okay, so, so, we, so it reduces the number of volunteers needed. Is that the general it's, idea? In, in the present setup, even now as we speak, um, the, the total number of workers at an election on a regular election, not not the early election, mm -hmm. it will be de decreased already. Um, there used to be eight. Now, now this is good. The, when I asked her for the, the next coming election, which is a town election, there's going to be a, a warden, a clerk, and two inspectors versus four inspectors. And she might have uh, an what they call an alternate come in just for cover for lunches and, and, and supper. So it'd be, um, th that would be a decrease of, of would, whole, thank you. whole workers. One one more addition to that particular line, 5221 electronic voting equipment, is she specifically also mentioned that annual fees for some of the equipment were previously paid out of other buckets as well. So what we will now see going forward is the annual fee that we pay on the equipment covered in this bucket. Bill Keller? Uh, yeah, David, I still got a... Um question, I guess, on the printing ballots. Uh, there's a new item, uh, there's a new amount of $20,000 for fiscal 23. And uh, is, is that replacing, is the printing of the ballots replacing something that was previously done electronically? No. Is this was a... Uh... It's actually several things now. So it takes that printed ballot that was previously on her other um, budget. It's also going to include um, postcards that she has to send out now that there have been changes in precincts, uh, notifying people of the changed precincts. Um, postcards for um, being able to register uh, to vote and various mailings like that that are increased costs this time around. So it's sort of a, it's not just the ballots, it's also all this, these other little postcards that have to be mailed out. Okay, so this a lot of this reverts back to the town clerk, um, the correct town clerk office budget because they're all under the same roof, correct? Um, another thing I wanna to bring to the attention of the, um, the finance committee, the, um, 
there's a uh, one of the things that they've been looking at is for on voting purposes is if um do you remember when we had the um the boards the panels around town telling you when the next election was and whatnot and there used to be one for every precinct and eventually they took them down well there's a proposal to bring them back in a different form but to bring them back and they would if they were able to do that now they would they would definitely cut cut back on the advertising for uh, future elections so that's another committee that's being formed to study that a lot of committees being formed thank you david okay um, any other questions on the election budget well if i could just make one more comment um that i i found interesting which is we actually get some money back on these elections but it doesn't show up in any of this um so we get let me see if i can um sorry when there's early voting the the time period so salaries from 7 a.m to 10 a.m actually get paid back uh, the state pays the town back for that um but it, it ends up going back so uh sandy explained to us today it goes back into it goes the town clerk has a an account we don't see that money gets paid into that she can then use and some of it also goes to the general fund and all of it eventually goes to free cash if it's not used so there there is this money allocated for salaries but we do see some reimbursement we just never know how much um so they budget the totality here presumably some of it comes back thank you christine you have your hand up yeah, so if you got what you just last said, the clerk has a separate fund into which money goes that we don't see? Well, because they don't budget for it, right? My understanding is that there's this account where the reimbursed money goes that it's, she can use. It, 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 um, Christine, if I can help you out on that, that it's a, it, this is relatively new and it has to do with early voting and the majority of the monies that come back from the state goes into the general fund, but there's other monies that we, that we just found out about talking to the clerk. It's a special account set up and it goes from the state to the clerk's office that she can use, I assume, on early voting only. Can we get a report on that? Can we get figure, can we find out how much is in that fund and how much has been spent well, that, from that fund? Well, Here's the situation. That that money, as we're talking about it now, hasn't come yet. And they don't know at this point, you never know what the dollar figure is until the dollar figure is 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 received. So that, that's where we stand at this point. Now that might come later on, who knows? But in the okay. past, in in the past when it was just money coming back from, from the elections, it would go to the general fund. They never knew when it was coming back and they never knew what what uh, total dollars it was, and it fluctuates from election to election. But has money gone into a fund that for the clerk's office? Yes. I I was probably to answer your question. I I assume so from the not the last early election, but the one before that, and then that some of that money went into um, the early the next early election. And I think some of that money was, they were able to use by the um, voter pads that, that we've been talking about. They bought three of them for that early election. And I think some of that money was used for that, I think. Well, I, I, I'm fine with bringing this budget up for a vote tonight, Charlie, but I, I do think that we should get a report on those funds. How much has, okay. has the, the clerk? Okay, well, what, what I'll do, what the expenditures have been that we we're not seeing. Yeah, I, I think the, the best the best place to get a response on that, um, David and, and Sophie, would be to talk to Ida Cody, uh, the town comptroller, and she will um, have records of that. Al Tosti? Yes. Yeah, I, I I've been listening to everything, and I, and I just haven't quite gotten to why this this budget is so much of an increase. I mean, we're talking 236% increase in the budget 
Uh, there's three elections that I know of. You know, the, 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 uh, the primary, the uh, regular in November and the town election, which was the same as 2021. Uh, is there something specific that would account for a uh, $120,000 increase over the last over the last time we had a uh, three election year? Well, but it would Al, what's added to the mix to the mix is this early voting that at this point we don't know how many days it's going to be. The last early voting we had, it ran the primary ran seven days and the regular election ran 14 days. Now that was the presidential election. Prior to that, it was it was um, the, when they first started it, it was eight days. So we don't know what the state's going to do in reference to the general election for the state of Massachusetts, how many days it's going to be for early voting for the primary and how many days it's going to be for the, um, the general election. So with that, um, there's, there's going to be money. I, I believe there has to be money for salaries if they're going to do that. So uh, some of this is, um, at this point, is an unknown fact as far as what's going to happen because the state's always the last, last to tell us what to do, what, what not to do. I would, I would add that also compared to, my understanding is the years we should be comparing are not the ones actually on here, but more, uh, for example, 2019, which was the last time there were uh, the, number, the numbers of elections match maybe. So this is a situation where it, the salaries and wages will fluctuate based on the number of elections. So it's not fair necessarily to compare year to year. So if I could just make a comment, Al, uh, in your, uh, to your question. So the, the 2023 uh, salary budget compared to uh, 2021 is about 40, um, $45,000 higher, okay? And, and that, I am assuming from what David said, that has to do with the number of elections. In, the mean, in, in addition, because of transfers of the printing budget um, and, the, and the increase in the electronic voting equipment, it looks like compared to uh, 2021, there's a $40,000 increase. So those two, those two numbers add up to eighty-five dollars or $90,000, which is almost the entire increase from $159,000 to $246,000. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's the source. That's the source of the change. Where were the ballots printed before? Where was that number? That was in the. That was in another budget. It was fifteen thousand dollars on the in the uh, clerk's budget. Can you go back to that uh, clerk's budget, Alan? So if you look at uh, five two two eight printing licenses was $15,000 in 2021. And this, now they're talking about $20,000 with an, I think an additional election plus early voting. So it's not um, entirely- Salary. A salary or, or un, you know, it's, it's rational. Let's put it that way. The, the problem is that the number of elections varies in these different years. And as, as uh, uh, Sophie mentioned before, they, uh, meaning the town, perhaps wasn't allocating these um, expenses into the right buckets. Okay. Al okay. Alan Jones. Uh, thank you, Charlie. I was wondering if I could suggest this is a, a budget it's got a fairly large salaries and wages, but there's no breakdown of it. Um, you know, without delaying the vote, um, could we request a, a breakdown of what's in the 981,995 and maybe the previous years to see exactly? They, you know, that, that was my question too today. I asked, uh, or yesterday specifically, and it, I, my understanding is that it's really just election workers and poll workers. So there isn't 
they don't that that table doesn't exist that does the police detail come from that also that i don't know um yes yes and 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 you also mentioned that the number of uh inspectors was going from four to two per precinct no seems like yes so, that, so let me make a suggestion if I can. I, I think yeah. we should postpone this budget. Um, I think that um, that if you uh, have a discussion with Eda Cody, you can probably get the breakdown of those expenses in uh, 2021 and 2023. And I think that will um, answer the questions that were raised by the members. Okay. Is that agreeable, David? Oh, absolutely. Whatever the committee wishes. Um, we're still in the process of meeting with other people as well for budget. So we're around the town. So we'll check in with the comptroller. And um, if you could um, just call her, she can, she, she'll, yeah. What, 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 tomorrow, when I go, I have to go to, we have to go to town hall tomorrow. Um, so, so for, uh, uh, another. Um, I, I think she may be in the um, in the uh, old central school building. Is she in the, in there, or, she, or is she also at Twenty Three Maple Street? Uh, I'm not sure. In, uh, central school. Central school. Yeah, but, yeah, but again, I'll be right there tomorrow, so so we can ask it. Um, if you could. Um, Sophie, have, have you got the, the questions? Have you been taking notes on the questions? Yes. Yes, I have. We lost David again. Okay. Is there is there another budget, David? Yes, I think he was prepared. I think we're prepared for the zoning board of appeals as well. Okay. Yeah. Go yes. Ahead. Thank you. The um, zoning is on page uh, seventy-five in the book, and if you folks remember when we had the town manager in last. Um, last time that he uh, explained what was going on with the zoning and appeals and um, the change in the budget is the fact that they're, they're looking for a full-time employee they presently have a part-time employee so they're in the process of hiring um, a full-time employee because the workload has just dramatically increased in in, in the zoning So with that, I'll recommend that we accept the uh, zoning budget as printed in, in the budget book, F23 budget book. Are there any questions on the zoning uh, board? Yes, Shane. Sorry, basic question. Thanks, Charlie. Can you just remind me like what the scope of the duties for the ZBA are? Um, <laughs> I, I, I know what the duties are of, of, of the... Um, the, the clerk's position in the zoning, what the zoning board does, um, it's not it's not my expertise. I've, I've never had anything to do with zoning. So if someone could help me out here, they have to have hearings and that they go through the redevelopment board. Uh, Sophie, you, you can, I know you have some familiarity with the zoning. Um, well, I think my basic explanation would be it's the board that oversees sort of um, it, applications for special permits for variances. Um, if there are any complaints and just with the building inspector's office, um, uh, 40B housing, you know, anything that's related that needs permits and anything zoning bylaw related, that's the, the board of appeals level after you go through the development board to your permits if you can feel it, building inspector, you can appeal it with that upper level. And then from there, you would go to state court if you're not um, satisfied 
with their decision. Thank you. Any other questions on uh, the zoning board? Okay, go ahead. Uh, did you make a motion, uh, David? I, I did. Okay, is second. there a second? Second. Seconded by Annie LaCourt. So, um, any further discussion? Hearing no further discussion, I'll take the roll call vote. Grant Gibeon? Yes. Jane Blundell? Yes. John Ellis? Yes. Kaya Healy? Yes. Sophie Migliazzo? Yes. Jonathan? Yes. Shailene Pokrit? Yes. Daryl Harmer? Yes. Annie LaCourt? Yes. Helen Jones? Yes. George Koser? Yes. William Keller? Yes. Alan Tosti. Yes. Wanda Nascimento. Yes. Christine Deschler. Yes. Dean Carmen. Yes. And David McKenna. Yes. Thank you. It's unanimous vote. The Zoning Board of Appeals budget. The next, uh, do you have any more budgets tonight, David? Uh, no, no uh, that's it for Sophie and I for tonight. And well, thank you for doing all this work on such a short, <laughs> short period of time. Um, yes, Sophie and I have been on an adventure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, the next is uh, the uh, reclass reclassification plan and human resources. Um, Makaya, are you uh, prepared for that? Yes, and I will try to entertain myself so that we can all stay awake. Um, I, I promised everybody that we would go to bed early, so, um, or at least end on time. So let's, the HR budget's on page 30. And um, if you wouldn't mind, please pulling that up for everybody to see. I do miss being in public or being in person because I'm sure you can probably hear my computer fan and all kinds of technical stuff. So I apologize if that is a distraction. Um, okay, so um, we can walk through the, through the line items, um, sort of like Professor Sandy. Um, and uh, so they're number one, I think they'll be a little change in salary and wages um, in the, and the longevity. Um, they did have a person that was promoted to another department um, and the person that replaced that per, per, um, that replacement went to a lower step. So there, that's the very small change in um, right there. So number two, uh, longevity, um, generally speaking, Longevity is just is simply a bonus for the years of service um, and how that is allotted came about from town meeting. Um, that's how the manager schedule, um, the M schedule follow that rule. Um, and it's usually a percentage after five years of service. Um, but for the most part, it's an allotment um, dictated by uh, respective collective bargaining agreements. Um, and that can vary uh, from uh, varies from percentage to flat dollar amounts. Um, so depending on which, whether you're union or non-union um, and what group of employees that you're in. Um, so if ever finance committee or we wanted to make a change to that structure, it would need to be bargained away. So if, um, uh, it's just a, a system that, that the director said that she, she, uh, she inherited. Um, and this is not unusual, again, among municipalities. A lot of people do these uh, steps and longevity. So just background for myself again, as I was reviewing my notes from last year, um, and then for any, any new person that needed that. Um, so if you look at the longevity number on this, this first page, and you flip to the salary side, you'll see that the total matches up. 
it's seven thousand eight hundred and fifty dollars um and uh the difference there is is based on the steps um uh, from um from the salary uh Um, so number three, the in-state travel. Um, so that's the director's um, mileage reimbursement to um, a conference that she attends. She put it at 250. Um, and you know, no one has been traveling very much for the past two years. Uh, so we may want to revisit that um, and make some modifications uh, depending on what happens this year with uh, this conference that she goes to a Massachusetts Municipalities Association of Personnel or something like that. So um, she just wanted to be conservative and put that in. Um, the training budget, you'll see that it is, again, $50,000. Um, it's used, half over half of the budget is used for facilitated, facilitated training with the National League of Cities, um, the NLC. There's about 75 people from across all the town departments, leadership from the police, the fire, um, middle management department heads, um, that, um, that attend these, these, these trainings. Um, and really in order to be a competitive, uh, employer, you know, this is, this is what the managers need to, to do is to learn how to educate about a diverse working place to become sensitive to the issues that we're all talking about. Um, and to just have the skills and the comfort level to be able to navigate these conversations. So there's um, a very powerful benefit of, of, of being involved with this National League of Cities. Um, there's two other components to this budget um, or to this, this item here. So she this is also where she pays for civil service exam promotional assessment center. So this is what, um, what uh, the school committee was presenting on. Um, and it's basically these assessment centers, it's an intensive interview process that allows them to, um, that is administered by a third party vendor. That's how the state um, uh, dictates that. Um, and so they can, they can uh, you know, learn more about the interpersonal skills, about their public speaking skills, about conflict manage management skills, um, just additional, um, additional set of skills um, for their candidates out, outside of the written test that um, is normally handed to them um, or the list of candidates that get handed to them. Um, and then the third component um, of training is uh, this three-year benchmark study also that was referenced tonight. Um, and that looks at a hundred schools um, in 12 town communities uh, to see where Arlington stands up um, and again, that is a three-year process. We started in fiscal year 14. Um, so if I can do the math, but 17, 20, and 23. So this June is when she, um, the HR director will restart this process. Um, and she uh, said that not only will they spend this money, but she, she anticipates coming back to, um, to request for more appropriation. Um, Office supplies, um, so that's, you know, the original appropriation is 2,500. Um, last year, FinCon gave money in the capital budget for certain modules in Munis to go paperless. Um, and, all, and so all of their personnel transactions are paperless um, and they, all of their onboarding materials all, are all digital. Um, but again, we can revisit this in 2024. Um, and I can tell from the school committee that <laughs> their presentation that they, they get along with the town employees a lot because they're using um, a lot of the same language. Like this isn't normal years. The, we're not in normal years. So, um, so um, you know, the HR director just wanted to be conservative and put that in. But again, like we can revisit that just as we're moving into more of like a Zoom and technical space. Uh, so the number six, the other purchase services is 3,700. Um, and the expenditures are, 
uh, a few things. So if they um, like to, you know, for example, the chief information officer, when they were posting for that position, they, they um, were posting to affinity special websites like women in technology or black and Latinos in IT. Um, so those sort of sort of outside of the traditional um, realms of advertisement for positions, um, the money will come from that. Um, and all the pre-employment physicals that they do for the, the town, uh, they kind of gray bill the departments and then um, so money flows in and out of this department. Um, offsets, um, this is, yeah, this, again, this is the magical land that Sandy uh, lives in. And so he asked the, you know, the um, managers for, you know, what they're spending on health insurance for all these four different employees. And so that is pretty standard. Um, uh, so yeah, the health insurance and the physicals for about 2000 contracts come from this, um, from this area. Um, and if I get any of this wrong, all of, all of you senior um, seniors can correct me, please, because uh, I'm learning this as well. Um, they do have three full-time um, and one part-time one part -time person um, who's at three quarters. Um, and so they, they have the second largest budget behind the school department. Um, they have a 20 million health insurance budget. Um, that the um, the benefits administrator, um, uh, you know, wires to the GIC every every two um, every month. Two million dollars goes um, to the GIC, um, and then they kind of manage the the budget between the town school, the retirees, um, and just multiple health insurance and um, money comes out of there. So. Um, I think that's what I can speak to. Or does anyone have any questions? Annie yeah, LaCourt up. does and Christine does. So, oh, Bill Keller. So let's start off with Annie. Yeah, so you mentioned it's glancing the Micaiah, but just because I'm doing the health and human services budget, I want to double yeah. check. Are you saying that part of that $30,000 is DEI training? The NLC, yeah, I, I, I believe that's how they would train. Um, Okay, so at least some of the National League of Cities training is DEI to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Okay, yeah. great, thanks. Yeah. It, it, excuse me, if I could just interrupt or make a comment, Andy. I think also some of this training um, is that uh, department managers have to be compliant with different personnel um, and management standards. So yes. Some of it goes for that too. Yeah, yeah. No, it's clear it's not all that, but it yeah. just I'm, you know, I'm going to be looking at the the DEI director's budget as well, and I just want to be clear that some training in that area is in human resources budget, and other money is being spent on more intensive programming, I believe, in DEI, and so it's just a crosstalk for when I meet with Christine. Yeah. Uh, Christine. I believe I will be meeting with Christine on the whole health and human services budget. I'm still waiting to hear back from No, I, I was asking, I, 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 I oh, was sorry. Asking, you finished. I was talking to Christine Deschler. It's late, don't worry. <laughs> this is all on me because uh, Makai, this is a really detailed and thorough explanation of this department. I really appreciate it. But did you say that, that she expects to spend the full 50,000 and more on training? And if, I knew, <laughs> and if that if that's the case, why is she just asking for fifty thousand and not the what she's actually expecting to need? That that is a fantastic. As soon as I said that, uh, like I was reading my notes on, and I, I you were the one. Um, I I don't know. I can ask her. <laughs> Thank you. Or the alternative question is, where does it come from? Yeah. Uh, Christine, is that all you had there? Yes, I, that, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Bill Keller. Uh, yeah, I know it's getting late, but I, I, I noticed something. It may just be a technical thing or a misprint on the budget. 
um, the offset is fourteen thousand. I'm sorry, eighteen thousand four hundred ninety-five dollars. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so um, <clears throat> on uh, when you go to get to the total for human resources taxation total, the offsets used there to bring the uh, total down to three sixty-four two eighty-three. Follow me. Right. So, so the offsets oh, mm -hmm. offsets used up above eighteen thousand yeah. four ninety-five. But it's also looks like it's used down below when you're adding up the totals for um, on the salary detail. So if you go to the far right, the salaries comes up to 326, 328, but it's reduced there by the offset. Mm -hmm. The 307, 833. So shouldn't shouldn't the uh, 2023 budget up above? Be 307833 and not 326 328. Did I lose you? Um, if, if I could comment on that, the, the, yeah. the number that is used up here is always the summer, the, the, the total of new pay, um, which includes the base and step. It's kind of funny. Then longevity, the 7850 comes up as a separate line item. And then the offset, even though it's reduced from salaries down here, it comes off the bottom line here. It's the way the manager's budget book is, but it's consistent across all the budgets. It is confusing. So when you look at this number, it should match this number. Uh, you have 326. Yeah, I don't know. I, I got a problem. Yeah. I don't I just see I just see the offset of uh 18495 actually being used yeah. twice. Um, it, it, it's, not, it's not included in this. The offset is not in the 317.085. If you, if you reduce that by the offset, you get the 298.590. Well, I'm going all the way to the end, uh, Alan, to the total. To here? Yeah. Right, and, and this never shows up up here. Yeah, the well, three good. You know, so the 326, 328 is is this, and then the offset's down here. If the offset was up here with salaries, where it probably should be, then it would match the 307.833. It isn't that way because they want to capture the actual salary totals. And if you okay. subtract the offset yeah. from it, it would not be the actual salary. It would be actual salary minus the offset. So that human resources salary total line represents the total human resources salaries. Yeah, it doesn't it just, represent the offset. Okay, I think we're wandering here. Okay, yeah, it, it, it's confusing, Bill, but that's just oh, that's the way. Fine. I think you'll find it's the same thing on all the budgets. I've right. never, I've never seen it used twice on the same on the same budget, but yeah, yes, I think I think it has. Yes, you have. Yes. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, are there other questions on uh, the uh, personnel budget, human resource budget? Okay, I don't see any other questions. So, um, would you like to make a motion, Micaiah? Um, I would like to make, oh, let me see if I have the words. Um, I'd like to approve the budget as it is printed here um, with, uh, is it appropriate to say, um, with the contingency to go and ask um, for, Answers to <laughs> those two questions. Yes. About, okay. Yes. Second. Thank you. Okay. It's moved and seconded. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, let's take a vote. Um, Grant Gibbion? Yes. Shane? Yes. John Ellis? Yes. Naya Healy? Yes. Sophie Migliazzo? Yes. Jonathan Wallach? Yes. Jaylene Pokris? Yes. Daryl Harmer? Yes. Andy LaCourt? Yes. Alan Jones? Yes. George Koser? Yes. Bill Keller? Yes. Al Tosti? Yes. Wanda Nascimento? 
Yes. Uh, Christine Deschler. Yes. Dean Carmen. Yes. And David McKenna. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. That's a unanimous vote. So um, I, I gather you probably don't have any uh, draft of the Warren article on the um, reclassifications. Okay. I do, but it won't. It will take longer than five minutes. Okay. So is that so? You have the actual detail that will go into the warrant. Um. Well, I went through it. The um, and I, I submitted it as um. I submitted it to, to the committee, for us to go over. Um, okay. Yes. No, I, I understand that, but I mean, normally, uh, go. Okay, we can talk about it at another meeting. That's good. Okay. Um, so it's uh, 9.55 and I think you're right. It'll take longer than five minutes. Yes, uh, David. I just want to bring the attention to um, uh, and the clerk in the election budget. Um, I neglected to also mention the registrar's budget. So we'll do that next time. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, well, we did uh, a, a, quite a number of budgets tonight. Thank you, David and Sophie and thank you, Micaiah. Um, are there any other subjects anybody wants to bring up before we sign off this evening? Uh, yes, yes. Um, I have a draft of the, um, an updated draft of the budget schedule. If anyone wants to look at that together, I could also, um, I'm, I can also email it, but um, I can kind of put it up now so we can take a look. Can everyone see this? Oops. Can everyone see this? Yes, I, I think I think we can. I, I, right. would, su I would suggest that you send it out. Um, just send it out. Okay. Yeah, maybe you send it out. Okay. It's, it's a little detailed to figure out just by looking from the screen. Yep. Um, so we didn't uh, we didn't approve any minutes tonight. Uh, let me suggest that we'll do the minutes uh, the first thing in the next meeting. We'll have. That means we'll have three nights worth of minutes to review at the next meeting. Um, any other subjects or questions this evening? Thank, thank you very much for your patience and attention. Uh, and, and I think, uh, Dean, if you talk to the school department, I think you can tell them that um, we were delighted with the um, presentation tonight. Will do. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good night. Uh, a motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay, I think it's unanimous. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.